Yours was sizzly. Welcome to Enter the Abyss, everybody. On another snowy day here in Utah in fucking April. Oh, that's good. Oh, my God. Everybody likes a raspberry blonde, right? Raspberry blonde ale from Ska Brewing, Durango, Colorado. 5% 5% alcohol by volume. I got, Of course, I went with the can. It's something like you'd see in a 50s diner. Oh, yeah. Yeah, with radiation and shit. Yeah. It's, cause it's, like the, it's got the skeleton wearing a top hat. It's got a strawberry blonde babe rolling around on a scooter. From Ska Brewing. Dun, 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 dun. You drinking it, bro? He's drinking it all right now. What the fuck? You just drank it all. Why? I don't fuck around. Oh my, okay. It's one of these episodes tonight. That was really good. See, to admire the taste, you have to get it all in one. You know, I used to be like adverse to um, fruit flavored beers, but they're actually rather good. You have to get the right one because there's some that are, I don't know, like, I don't know. I'm, I like sours. Like some people don't like them because they're really sour, but yeah, you have to do them right because sometimes like the ones we had... From um, like the key lime pie or whatever you hated that one, <laughs> I don't peach <laughs> cobbler. Yeah, it was the really cool cans. Uh, I just and you're re- like, this is ass. <laughs> that sounds like something I would. I say. will give you the you know benefit of the doubt. It was assy, <laughs> but this is really good. If you see the raspberry blonde ale from Scott Brewing, definitely pick it up. So we're getting close to Clown Motel. Yeah, like we've got there. We're just. We're waiting on the camera. There was a little bit of a delay in shipping it to us because that's how things work. But uh, we're getting everything booked. And in a short few weeks, you'll get to see us go out to Nevada. BFE. It's literally in the middle of fucking Dude, I'm, nowhere. I'm fucking ready. I'm so excited. I'm so ready. And we do have someone else that's going to be joining us to film us. So you get to see both of us on camera all the time. Lucky for you. You get to look at our ugly mugs. Yeah. yeah. I so, love, like, I've, I've watched some... Uh, um, I don't know, YouTube shorts of it. I had people visiting visiting the hotel, and they're like, oh, we're here during the day because we don't want to be here during the night. Like, Oh, hell yeah. I don't spook easily. I'm going to tell you that much. We're I doing most don't. of it at night. Like, we're <laughs> All of it at night? We're doing most of it It's at just going to be a black screen. You can't see anything. <laughs> you can hear us, right? We're doing some spooky shit. Just listen to our voices. Uh, I'm excited, though. It's yeah, going to be awesome. So we'll spend the night. We're going to do, obviously, Ouija boards, spirit box, ghost rods, all that shit. Maybe some alcohol. I don't know. I'll bring alcohol. Definitely some alcohol. Yeah, I'm going to drink alcohol. Definitely alcohol. There's going to be a lot of alcohol involved. You check, like, arrest <laughs> records later. Like, How much did you drink? Two please? wannabe <laughs> documentarists Why were arrested. <laughs> the two drunkest people ever to be at the He's clown trying hotel. trying to fight a cardboard cutout of a clown. Pennywise. <laughs> um... I do feel bad because it was October. We were looking at it, and they had a night that, like, unlimited beer. Unlimited free beer. How did we time. fuck that up? That would have been a good, good time. How did we fuck that up? Mm. I don't know. Maybe we can call them and be like, hey, we're coming. Podcast. Free limited beer. Yes? Yeah. Mm. Yes. Get, a, mm. get yeah. all the clown beer out. Yeah. All the clown beer. But, yeah, we are really excited. You're going to see us all on camera, and then going forward, we'll, you know, record our sessions here. On camera. I'm fucking ready. It's going to be exciting. Yeah. It's going to be exciting for us. Maybe not for everyone else. <laughs> but uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> so we will be discussing um, of some people who cracked the code of a possessed nun who wrote a letter. A that no one could uh, read until now. Yeah. Straight from the if, devil. I don't know if I know about this. Yeah. How long ago was this? This happened pretty recently. Oh. So we'll, we'll talk about it. I mean, the, the possession happened in like the 1600s, oh. but the de- the decoding of the letter happened recently, and we'll be talking about the Codex Gigas. Gigas. Giggity, giggity. Gigas. Um, and I'm going to be filling it in with some actual good old-fashioned possessed stories from the interwebs. So lots of possession. So if you've got your uh, holy water next to you and your rosary, keep it close. Yeah, the power of Christ will compel you. Okay. But before we start, we got some fan mail from uh, someone named Jake. Love he, fan mail. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you like us, uh, send up some uh, fan mail. Whatever Give you want. Scary we will stories. read your we'll stories. Read mm-hmm. Anything. Mm-hmm. This, uh, he says, hey, Britton and Cleet, I'm a huge fan of your podcast. First of all, get better taste. Um, <laughs> it's my go-to whenever I'm on a long car ride. Anyways... This is something that keeps me up at night, and I believe that the abyss is the most appropriate 
place for my story. The deep, dark, moist abyss. So crack open a cold one and let me introduce you to the Wisconsin Fledgster. Uh, Feldgeister. <laughs> Feld- Did you say f- the Wisconsin Fister? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to introduce you to the Wisconsin Fister. Fel- Feldgeister, I guess. I'm going to finish this beer. The Wisconsin Fister. Oh, he's got the pinky up and everything. Ladies and gentlemen, leaning back in his chair. Oh, God. I haven't done that since college. Okay, might as well get drunk before I read. Uh, Tell us about this fister. (laughs) In the summer of 2020, I worked in Plainfield, Wisconsin, for a crop dusting operation. It was the most middle-of-nowhere place I'd ever been to. I mixed pesticides in a vat and then loaded it into airplanes. Damn, that's a cool job. Yeah, right? We worked long hours, and I usually got off at night when it was too dark for the planes to fly. I would often have other busy work to finish after all three aircraft were taken care of. One night, in late July, it was around 10 p.m., and I had to fill up a jerry can with kerosene. Nothing ever good comes from filling a jerry can with kerosene. <laughs> it's like you're like a horror setup. <laughs> horror movie setup. What do you do with that? I don't know. We want to toss in those matches real quick, light them for a few seconds. I was smoking. The fuel was inside a shed that was on the property's edge, and behind it was a huge cornfield. Oh, snap. As I walked to the shed, I had my flashlight in one hand and the jerry can in the other. I saw what looked like someone standing on the edge of the cornfield, and I assumed it must have been a farmer or maybe one of my co-workers. So I shined my light on them, and what I saw was an eight-foot gray shadow figure. Not Slenderman. Looked like it was made of smoke. I said something like, Hey, what's up? Keep in mind, this is the last thing I have to do before my 12-hour shift is over, and at this point, I just want to go to bed. So I really didn't give a fuck. That's kind of like how I feel all the time. Yeah, you know, I really just need to get to bed, so... Whatever. My life is full of sighs. It's like, ah. What an inconvenience this is right now. A mild inconvenience. Really want to get to bed. But this shadow figure. After I called out to it, it turned around and just looked at me for a second and then turned back to the corn. Now that I think back on it, I think it was squatting and then stood up when I shined my light on it. Kind of felt like a fever dream. It's strange because I wasn't scared at the moment of this encounter. I continued to walk to the shed and refilled my jerry can. That's a dedicated employee. Yes. It wasn't until I lied down in bed that the reality of what happened struck me. I looked up the Wisconsin corn spirit, the only words I could describe it with, and after doing some research, I think I encountered the Fieldgeister. The wiki info states that the Fieldgeister is a corn demon of German folklore. They are said to appear when the corn is at its highest which it was at the time of my encounter, and are supposed to protect the crop for whatever reason. I'm too lazy to give the full description, (laughs) but I recommend giving it a wiki search. I also want to state that Wisconsin does have a large Polish and German population and, and replicates the same environmental conditions as well, which only supports my suspicion of why I encountered it at this very place and time. I know it sounds ridiculous, It's hard to even explain it to myself, but I believe I encountered something paranormal. Well, goddamn. Maybe I was just working around the chemicals for too long. What do you think? What do you think, Britton? Well, I also believe in the paranormal, and I think it could have been a big alien. I don't know. All right, let's pull up a picture of this. Wisconsin Feldgeister. Pull up a picture. Assuming you're going to put this on the YouTube, of course. Huh. It's kind of like a Wendigo. Yeah. All right. That's kind of creepy. Yeah, these are pretty freaky, man. It's like a lot of like AI images and stuff. He said it looked like smoke, so it probably looked yeah. like... Yeah. But it was squatting. Uh-oh. Hmm. All right. Pretty freaky. Lots of creepy stuff in the corn. But thanks for the story, Jake. Really appreciate it, and I, I'm glad that you like the podcast, and we can keep you company on your long drives. Hopefully, though, you're not playing around with too many chemicals. All right, let's talk about the possessed nun who uh, wrote a letter while under the influence of uh, demonic possession. Oh, maybe a little bit of LSD. Someone should have pulled her over. All right. Yeah. The Ursuline Covenant of London in (laughs) London was a place of piety and devotion. 
But in the year of 1632, a darkness descended upon its hallowed halls. Sister Jean des Agnes, a woman known for her unwavering faith, began to exhibit strange and disturbing symptoms. She spoke in tongues, writhed on the floor in agony, and claimed to be tormented by visions of a malevolent priest. I'm no priest, mm. but it uh, seems like an exorcism waiting to happen. Soon, the possession spread throughout the covenant. Other nuns began to succumb to the same torment. They contorted their bodies into unnatural positions, uttered blasphemies, and accused Father Urban Grandier, the local parish priest, of casting spells upon them. The possessed nuns became living nightmares. Their once angelic voices now filled with demonic growls. Yikes. Yeah. They're pretty. just praying in growls. Mm. Yeah, maybe. It you, was the, it if was, you heard that in a Catholic church, what would you do, Britain? Mm. I wouldn't be in a Catholic church. I'd just leave. I'd just leave. <laughs> just like, yeah, I'm leaving. It was the iceberg, right, that we covered. I think you got it. The the nuns that just started meowing. <laughs> and then the militia showed up and just started Meow. beating the Jesus <laughs> out of It was like, not... I'm like, what kind okay. of person are you to uppercut a Quit nun? meowing! God damn it! <laughs> Quit meowing! It's so inappropriate. A special person to uppercut a nun right in the chops, man. <laughs> what is this, Mortal Kombat? <laughs> Finish her. All because they decided to meow. Yeah. Anyways, in the midst of the chaos, Sister Jean penned a letter. A desperate cry for help. But this was no ordinary letter. It contained a series of cryptic symbols and coded messages believed to have been dictated by the devil himself. Dun, dun, dun. For centuries, scholars have puzzled over its meaning, searching for clues to the true nature of Sister Jeanne's possession. Sound of computers beeping. Beep, 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 beep. And now we are in 2020s. It, it was, only took thousands of years to interpret this fucking letter. Recent advancements in cryptography have finally unlocked the secrets hidden within Sister Jeanne's letter, which I think is just so fucking interesting. That is crazy. Uh, the, de the decoded text reveals a chilling account of the nun's torment, her struggles against the demonic forces that possessed her, and her ultimate fate. Just imagine them like reading the letter back then, like, I am fucking perplexed. <laughs> what does this even say? <laughs> I'm Satan. Lol, 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 lol. Oh, LOL, LOL, <laughs> smiley face emoji. I totally took over this bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take that this out. is quite the vessel. <laughs> You're editing, so you can do whatever you need, bud. Like, oh my God. <laughs> Wait, whoa. <laughs> this is weird, guys. This is weird. This you drinking your holy water? It's wine. Hell yeah. Gotta have wine when we're talking about the Catholic Church. Right. It used to be water. But perhaps the most astonishing revelation of all was the identity of the devil who was supposedly dictated the letter. It was not a supernatural being from the depths of hell, but rather a mortal man, Urban Grandier, a charismatic priest who alleged sorcery had sparked the events that led to Sister Jeanne's possession. Um, ah, now we got a fucking sorceress priest. Yeah. You know, people uh, did a lot of things for entertainment, I guess, in the 1600s. Alakazam, you are now possessed by Satan! <laughs> um, some other interesting sentences that were decoded. Uh, talked about the relationship between humans, God, and Satan in a rambling and inconsistent manner throughout the text. Uh, for example, one pre-cert here is God thinks he can free mortals. Sister Maria's letter says, adding that this system works for no one. The text also describes God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as uh, dead weights. Wow. Um, that's it. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty interesting stuff. Yeah. Okay, so this comes from someone under the pen name Possessed DTW. I've never told this story to anyone because one, just talking about it freaks me out good. And two, I know that 99% of people will not believe me. But here's to Reddit. Warning, pretty long post here about exorcism and stuff. Don't read if you don't want to believe. And if you want to sleep tonight. Man, I'm hooked. I'm hooked. Yeah. Mm. I am a six foot two rather fit man. I practice Aikido. <laughs> I practice Aikido and can bench press 240. Wow. He's really going. I also up. make 150 grand a year. Here's my number. <laughs> I drive a Tesla. 
My father and his brothers are pretty much as tall as I am, maybe less strong due to age, although most of them have been in fighting sports for a while. One of my aunts is about five foot four, probably weighs like 110 pounds at best. There was this time when she really went plain crazy. She would get incredibly angry, out of control at random times, spitting nonsense words, and there would be absolutely no way I, or my father, or both of us could be able to get her down. But bro, I thought you could bench press 240. This felt like DBZ Yamcha trying to get perfect sell into a UFC submission. I'm, I don't know so UFC. DBZ, so whatever. Dragon Ball Z? I guess. Is that the reverence or am I oh, just crazy? Oh, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. DBZ, okay. probably Dragon Ball Z. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. She had 10 times my strength. We needed four of us to actually pin her down and get her to stop moving until she calmed down. That was extremely scary. She could just pop off at any time and go completely crazy. Now, I didn't believe in the supernatural, but my grandmother, a rather traditional Moroccan woman, was convinced that she was possessed. And, honestly, it really felt like it. For those who don't know it, Morocco has a pretty big culture about supernatural, sorcery, possessed exorcism shit. So most of the elders in the family firmly believe in it. Fast forward a few months later when it was getting way too difficult for us to handle her. It just... <laughs> It's not funny, but like I just imagine like you're just at dinner and she just gets this roid rage, starts flipping the table, and it, the whole family has to tackle her. Start bring cracking her down. your knuckles, getting yeah, ready seriously. to like she just starts like handle her, twitching her veins all bulge on her neck, and say, like, "Oh shit, Auntie's having a moment." What is she, Bane from Batman? She it just, sounds like her, it. Her like matter or density just gets bigger. <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, this guy obviously is super tall and impressive. I mean, he spent the first five minutes telling us how cool he was. I am your aunt, and I'm going to kick your ass. I was born in the darkness. My uncle contacted a good friend in Morocco who was an exorcist in the family. The exorcist asked us to do one rather twisted thing. He asked my aunt if she could put a drip of her blood in a glass of water and leave the glass somewhere in the apartment while she's sleeping, not next to her. We were reluctant, but my grandmother forced her to do it. On the morning, the glass was empty. I'm still convinced that she probably just woke up at night and drank it, but the exorcist version was, She is possessed by a demon, commonly known in the Muslim culture as Janan or Jinn. Giving him this blood was just a way for you to welcome him and calm him down temporarily, and she needs to see an exorcist ASAP. Now, we're getting convinced that he was right, seeing her often getting crazier and crazier. In desperate times, sometimes you just choose to believe to be... Sometimes you just chose to believe a possible solution. So at this point, I decided to believe in what he said, and we had to go get a proof that he was right. We live in France. We decided to drive to Morocco, which is about 1,500 kilometers driving, plus a six-hour boat, plus 500 kilometers in Morocco again. During the drive, I've never been as scared as this day. I was sitting down behind on the right, my father on the left, my aunt between us. She starts, like, <laughs> bulking up again in the car. It's like, shit, 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 pull over. She went crazy at some point. We couldn't really hold her. She's trying to hit my uncle while driving. We almost ran into a wall, and my father had to dangerously choke her until she lost some strength. I just think this is a, <laughs> a dangerous line that, in this story that we're talking about. Yeah. Right? <laughs> just another manic woman. <laughs> I look over and my dad is just choking the hell out of it, my ass. It was totally deserved because she had supernatural powers. She was powers. just going nuts. I don't know, man. What like the dark side of the story is I think they just didn't like their aunt. Ugh. I think that's where this is going. Anyway, here we are in Morocco, getting to this village named Sefru, known as one of the biggest places in the country where sorcery happens. Rather creepy place. And not in a conventional creepy way. What we know of creepy are just what horror movies picture. The African creepy is on another level. We get to meet this exorcist guy. He asks us to buy a sheep to sacrifice and tells us that we should bring him the sheep's guts back to him for the exorcist to happen. My father and uncle take care of this. Me, I am fucking scared. As stated earlier, I didn't believe in that shit. I decided to because honestly, this situation called it. But at this point, in a freaking spooky village in the middle of Morocco, where we are advised to never eat anything outside or accept anything from strangers who might try to curse us, where everything looks twisted as fuck, I was really losing it and couldn't wait to leave this place forever. <sighs> Fucking mustache. All the sheep salesmen are making a lot of money because of these possessions. Yeah, man. Okay, you gotta, you gotta get the guts. Sorry. Yeah, for some more guts. And uh, Sheeps are extra expensive right now because of uh, Satan. 
Yeah. Sorry. Satan's really driving up There's the a, sheep prices. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a blind man. Yep. Blame well, Satan. Sorry. Yeah. No, blame Satan for sure. Or the Malians. And on the following day, we went to the exorcist, bringing him these guts, just a big old tub of guts. He puts them in a bowl and asks if we're feeling strong enough. We should stay with him as more people would make it easier to exercise my aunt. Well, I really wanted to leave, but seeing everybody was staying, I stayed as well. My aunt is lying down in front of us, next to the bowl. We're sitting down, around, holding her hands, and the exorcist starts saying stuff that I can't understand. It was traditional Arabic, and not a Moroccan dialect. He gets sweaty as he talks faster. I see my aunt twitching in what looked like pain. The light went out. Holy shit, I think I peed my pants at this moment. The exorcist screams something. My aunt screams as well, then total silence. I think the silence was for about 30 seconds, but it felt like hours. The exorcist's assistant then comes in with a lamp, and we see that both my aunt and him had passed out. The bowl is on the floor, the guts next to it. The guts turned black. I'm having goosebumps just writing that and repicturing it. The assistant urges us not to touch the guts at any cost. Exorcist wakes up, goes to put some water on his face, then tells us to follow him. We went to a nearby empty hill, and on top of it, he asked us to burn the guts right there, as the demon was now possessing the sheep, and we could now get rid of it. Done. I've never seen my aunt showing any problem whatsoever since this day. Her crisis periods never happened again, and she never went back to this angry mode. To this day, that honestly still scares the shit out of me. Just seeing her now gives me the chills. The worst part is, her sons love me, but I really have trouble staying around her, as I am genuinely scared, and they obviously don't know why. This is actually the first time I shared this story, and I'm shaking on my keyboard right now. After this event, I grew really interested in the whole Moroccan demon mythology and learned a lot about it. Now, I don't believe they exist. I know they exist, and they don't make much difference anyway, aside from this kind of event. If you actually want to know more, feel free to ask me the details. I talked more in detail with the same exorcist guy, and holy shit. The world is big and deep, and we don't understand a tenth of it. Super deep. Damn. Okay, let's talk about the Codex Gigas. Legend tells of a monk who wrote a giant manuscript with the aid of the devil. This legend is attributed to the real artifact, a huge Bible called the Codex Gigas, also known as the Devil's Bible. The story begins with a monk named Herman the Recluse, who supposedly struck a deal with the devil to create this enigmatic book. It is said that Herman, after committing a grave transgression, begged his abbot for redemption by promising to create a grand codex that would contain all human knowledge and bring eternal glory to the monastery. Locked away in a room with vellum and ink, Herman embarked on his fateful endeavor, turning to the devil himself for assistance. Devil, help me. So people talk about how he did some type of transgression. They don't say what it was, but he was Ah. likely to be just, you know, killed. It's a mystery transgression. They were going to murder him. Okay. And he's like, well, just give give me one day, and I will give you this thing that has... All of human knowledge that you could potentially have. The good old he turns, muck duck. He turns to the devil. Yeah, okay. a little mukbang. <laughs> Herman began to pray, not to God, but to Satan. He offered up his eternal soul in return for the book to be completed by dawn. And it was. Legend has it that the devil agreed to help and signed his work with a selfie, as there's a full-page illustration of the devil within right in the center of the book, in a folio that is otherwise empty. But the mysteries surrounding the Codex Gigas do not end there. The manuscript's size and intricate illustrations have astounded scholars. Despite its age, the text remains flawless, free of any signs of aging or damage one would expect after 800 years. The writings should show aging. The text is flawless, from the first page to the last, which is pretty strange. One person is quoted saying, Moreover, the Codex Gigas contains a chilling five-page confession of sins, detailing Herman's darkest thoughts, acts, and even, Britain, bestiality. Why the fuck would you say my name first? First of all, motherfucker. (laughs) 
You're the one who has all the goats out back. <laughs> not. Right, no, not. No. No. I was going to say something. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Better not. Why the fuck would you say my name? <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> punch you out, sir. <laughs> Britain. It's a Bestiality. Real, it's a real pretty goat you have back there. <laughs> the inclusion of exorcism rituals within the book lead some to believe that that the devil himself was the author. The five-page-long confession of sins is intense. It is a full listing of every sinful thought, word, and act Herman committed and includes pride, envy, Cleat. gluttony, lust, and bestiality. Cleat. Confessed one right after the other in writing. <laughs> so first of all, like, I don't know. That's I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep going. Hang if on. If I was at a bookstore and I saw a book and it literally, the author was like, The Devil, I would buy it. <laughs> Why not? It's like, The Devil wrote this. I don't know. This box just showed up and it said, The Devil wrote it and we just wanted to sell it. I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. Number one New York Times bestseller list The uh, Devil. The Devil. Called The Cheesecake. Anyways, today, the Codex Gigas is housed in the Swedish National Library, preserved behind bulletproof glass. Ah. If you're feeling brave, you can even view the, di- the digitized version of every page online, examining the incredible detail within this captivating artifact. It's, ah, it's in Sweden, though. I want to go see it, but I don't want to go all the way to Sweden. However, beware of the eerie tales associated with the Devil's Bible. One chilling account tells of a guard who was locked inside the library overnight and witnessed all the books, led by the Codex Gigas and the devil himself, swirling in the air. We got to him in the morning, and he was in the romance section, completely naked. (laughs) The traumatized guard was never the same, eventually institutionalized and forever haunted by the haunting vision and the dread-filled night. The books, the books... They were floating. Oh, my God. And the devil. The books he, can fly. He, he looked like a goat that was attractive. It was the Gigas. He was the most attractive goat I've ever seen. <laughs> right. Cleet. The Codex Gigas remained shrouded in mystery, captivating us with its dark allure. Its origins of the extent of its infernal involvement may forever elude us, leaving us with the eternal fascination for this truly devilish manuscript. Whether or not the devil's hand was in it somehow, his creation is miraculous. That's uh, I wonder how much they want it for. It's a huge book. I read online that if someone were, were to like start and do it again today, it would take them five years. To read the whole book? No, no, to create it because oh, of the illustrations. I and see. like the book itself is like it's uh, three feet. Like it's and it's not three feet. Maybe it's like two and a half. Jesus but it's huge, Christ. dude. The book is huge. And there is a picture of the devil in it. And I will pull up a picture of it for you. Are you ready? Hell yeah. Are you ready? Yes. It's really scary, man. Sure. Okay, here we go. <laughs> what? It's the scariest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> is he wearing a diaper? Yeah, dude. He doesn't want to show his penis. It's he's rude. wearing a diaper and he's got a coat. Maybe on he his doesn't head. have a penis. I mean, he could have. A, he could have a, a vagina. vagina you're, you're right. Yeah. You're afraid to say vagina, Cleet? You could have both. You could say penis, but you won't say you vagina. You could be intersex. You're right. You very well could be. Yeah. They very well you could, could have be. a cunt. Yeah. <laughs> From left field. Okay. That's uh, okay. That's interesting. I, I would read it. I'd, I'd sit down and read a two and a half foot book. Yeah. Why not? Size matters. Some good stuff. When it reading. comes to reading. Man, how big is your book? I don't want to brag, but it's a good foot and a half. I got a, when I fold it in half, it's a foot. <laughs> On a good day, eight inches. <laughs> All right, this is from Loldemort7. Loldemort. Loldemort, huh? LOL Demort. I've never known what to make of this. The high school that I went to was a religious private school. Senior year, it was a traditional for the entire senior class to go on a religious retreat up into this remote resort in the mountains with a few teachers. The point of this retreat was to grow closer to each other as a class and also to find God, experience spirituality, They took away our phones and forbade us from using any form of the internet or communication with the outside world. Then they made us go through a series of soul-bearing exercises and speeches and whatnot. Honestly, pretty cheesy stuff. Not that exciting. On the third day of the retreat, however, the entire grade is in the main hall doing an hour of silent prayer. 
is pretty much like meditation, but we're supposed to be communicating with God. All of a sudden, there's a huge crash, and everyone looks over to see a girl toppled over onto the floor. As everyone stares, she starts writhing around on the ground and screaming, but not screaming in, like, pain. The voice that she was screaming was in a really strange, deep voice and didn't sound like her at all. Someone yelled, She's seizing! I remember that because there was a girl in our class who was known to have epileptic seizures and would do it in assembly pretty frequently, but it wasn't the same girl. Then she stood up and started yelling in tongues. Her eyes were rolled up and her head kept twitching back and forth. She started to run all around the room, yelling in an unintelligible gibberish language. Every now and then she would run at the cross in the middle of the room and then run back, screaming, crying. What would be your first thought, Cleet? <laughs> I'd be like, you know, I'm not going to sit with her during lunch. Yeah, she was, my friend. I'm avoid her. Not anymore. At first, I honestly thought this was a dumb high school prank to freak everybody out. But if that's what it was, she took it way too far. The teachers tried to calm her down, but she just kept screaming in this weird language. She started pulling on her hair, so one of the teachers called an ambulance. But we all knew it would take a while for them to get to this remote retreat. Another teacher tried to take her by the shoulders, and she dug her nails into his arm really hard and just kept screaming. It took several more minutes to calm her down. The teachers actually evacuated us from the room, about time, and then she just went quiet. They took that girl away that night, though I don't know how. We were all kept in the cafeteria after that, and she never came back to school after the retreat was over. I wasn't friends with her friends, so I don't know if they knew what really happened. Probably expelled for her prank, but maybe not. It went on way too long and convincingly for me to really tell myself that she'd fuck around in front of all the teachers like that. It was insane. I don't know. None of the teachers were ever allowed to talk about it when we asked. But that's the story. It's crazy, man. Crazy. All right, this one's out of sight, Vegemite. <laughs> Vegemite. It's very healthy. My family used to own and run a real estate office. My grandfather owned it, and he was the boss. My mother managed the rent, role, and clients, and I worked there on weekends as a teenager. We worked in a multicultural area, which I always loved, and there was a reasonable Maori Islander community there, a lot of whom were very religious. In one particular property we managed, there was this one family who had two sons. One of them played football with my brother, and the other is the subject of this incident. So this kid was 11, I think, and according to the family, began acting strangely. He'd have violent outbursts, say terrible things, stuff like that. Apparently, he was really seriously out of control. The family called their Baptist, I think, minister, and asked what they should do. Big bad Baptist. Yeah, the breakfast one. Blueberry cobbler Baptist. That'll fix him. Was there even anything that they could do? The minister told them that he was free one evening later that week and that he'd bring the things needed for a baptism. He said that he'd perform an exorcism for them and a good spiritual leader, good religious people, and a baptism could oust an evil spirit. All you need is a good spiritual leader, some good religious people, an ice cold beer, and hell, if we don't expel that demon, I don't know what will. Hell yeah. Hey yeah. There, superstar. Beer. This particular evening arrived and the minister got all set up. He got this deep tub, which they all filled with water for the baptism. He got this deep tub, which they all filled with water for the baptism. He chose some passages from the Bible that he'd help with the exorcism and got the whole family to gather around for support and prayer. Now, Islander families tend to be large. There were aunts and uncles, cousins and grandparents. Everyone was there and willing to help this child. The parents are instructed to bring out the kid, so the father goes in to get him. The kid was a fucking mess. He was described as being like the Tasmanian devil from the cartoons, just all over the place. <laughs> That's pretty wild, man. We call him Taz. <laughs> his dad put the boy over his shoulder and brought him down to where everyone was standing. The kid was fighting at every single step. With his father being an absolute enormous man, he didn't stand a chance. The minister said for everyone to gather around, put their hands on the child, and to pray for him. The father held him in the middle of the family group, and everyone reached out their hands to touch the boy who was thrashing around like a wild thing. What I heard was that it seemed like the boy was totally out of control. Time comes for the minister to say whatever it was, he said, and then for them to get him into the tub for the baptism, which was supposed to expel the demon that they figured was possessing him. 
The father and an uncle or something were the ones who got him into the tub, and the family stood around praying their hearts out. But the boy tried to escape the second his body hit the water. He put up a crazy fight, and more family members came to get into the water. Finally, they got him in, and they were able to hold him there. And hold him. And hold him. And hold him. And hold him. They did. They didn't mean to do it, but they drowned him. He was an 11-year-old boy who was on the cusp of puberty. Of course, his behavior was erratic. Of course, his attitude was fucking awful. And of course, he fought being held down by his own family. What did they think was going to happen? The parents, uncle, and minister were all arrested. The uncle got off on an accessory charge. and The parents got 10 years, but got out sooner. And the minister got 15 and was in just about the whole time because he was the leader. He should have known better. My mom had to go and talk to the police, be a character witness, talk about the family and the property and whatnot. That certainly wasn't the only awful thing that happened while I worked there, but it was the most traumatic. What the fuck, bro? Can you imagine? Like, just, oh, this kid's possessed, and then they fucking drown him? Gotta hold him underwater for five minutes, and he won't be possessed anymore. Yeah. Or alive. So that's a rough story. All right, so we're going to end with a story by Even Fennel, 7962. This happened when I was nine years old, living with my mother in a small apartment above a pizza shop. The building was 1800s era and was very eccentric. Old designs, such as doors, made of very rough and unfinished wood, and a creepy attic, of course. The door to it being inside poor kid me's bedroom. This creepy attic has the door in your bedroom. Yeah. Just stays in bed looking at the door like, don't come down. I'm coming down there. I was a strange kid, usually hid in my bedroom or on the couch, on my laptop. I also had an interest in the paranormal, so I had things like a Ouija board, video camera, that kind recorded onto CDs, and more tools to try and go ghost hunting. The possession is the true conclusion to the story I'm going to tell. Many different events led up to this scary, borderline, traumatizing event for me. Scary, bizarre things happened daily in this apartment. To list a few, the old wooden attic would frequently slam and open. We would hear voices at night, people coming up our apartment stairs, and more. My mom even installed a lock on the outside of the attic door to make me feel safer. Unfortunately, it only scared me more when I'd hear the chain lock slide open and the old <laughs> wood the door fuck? creak, <laughs> letting a cool breeze into my bedroom. Deep voice saying, let me in. Oh, fuck. <laughs> That's creepy. My, this <laughs> nine-year-old kid, like, he imagines, <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Yeah, that's going to traumatize the fuck out of anybody. For some reason, I thought it was a female voice. It's crazy, man. Bearded lady from the circus. (laughs) Want to touch my beard? I will keep this story brief and and get on with the more serious happenings, starting with our cat, Gemini. We had a lovely cat who was small enough to fit through a rotted hole in the attic door and often wandered up there on her own. We made sure nothing unsafe was up there, like rat bait or anything, and even put a cat tree up there for her. It made me feel a little better, thinking that the noises in the attic could just be the cat. Jim and I went missing for a while, but we still heard the noises in the attic, so we assumed she was just hiding. After about five days of not seeing her, my mom found her long, decomposing corpse in the attic, directly in front of the stairs. We got another cat. Damn, dude. The next incident still shakes me to this day. My mom would frequently walk from our apartment to the next door convenience store to grab some quick food. One day, she went out to grab some things, and I waited in my room. Roughly five minutes later, I heard her coming up the stairs with a heavy gait, like she was carrying something, and yelled to me, Come help out! It was unmistakably her. I leave my room and prepare to put my stuff away just to find a completely empty apartment. No one was here. My mom arrived about five minutes later and was really scared by what I had told her had happened. It's absolutely her voice and her footsteps. I wish it was a prank, but the same thing happened again weeks later. Me and my mom were in the living room together. She had been dating this guy who would often come by and visit spontaneously. Very spontaneously. (laughs) Just in the middle of the night, he would show up. I don't know why. Constantly just making macaroni and cheese. (laughs) We both heard him coming up to our apartment and yelled up, Hey girls, want to come grab some food? Or something to that extent. Me and my mom both got up to greet him just to find, again, nobody. I know you might be thinking that it's noise from the pizza store below, 
but it always had the exact voice slang and said phrases the person would say regularly. The way the voices resonated was definitely not from below the apartment. It was in the apartment. I had a Ouija board, as any curious kid would back then. I made my mom play with me, even though we only had two people, which wasn't technically enough. I've never heard of a mom playing a Ouija board with their kid. Come on, it's Hasbro. You've never done that with your kids? No. I mean, come on! Not yet. I mean, I will eventually. After a nice steak dinner, you know, pull out the Ouija board. In this economy? Talk to the devil. Yeah, right? Some Ouija board things happened. Just some, you know, standard Ouija board things. However, at one point, the piece literally flew across the whole living room with immense force. I know that's so stereotypical, but that's just what happened. My mom made me burn the Ouija board in a campfire not long after that. Our new cat eventually became pregnant by a stray. I found her giving birth in the attic and called my mom up eagerly to come see. We're both watching the kittens when I heard the attic door shut and the chain lock slide. My mom then began seizing intensely, and I was absolutely horrified. I had no idea what to do at that age, so I called my best friend on my LG Rumor cell phone and said my mom was dying and that I need help. They called an ambulance for us. My mom woke up before they arrived and had this angry, scary expression and was slurring her words, but she was almost growling every word and said that I'm a curse. It sounded like. EMTs arrived and I went to go meet them, but found that I was locked in the attic with my scary mom. I called my friend again in a total panic, and they told the EMTs to come into the attic. They took basic vitals and left. I don't know if it was my mom playing up some strange but it, um, but explainable events in the house, maybe faking the Ouija incident, but these memories really irk me to this day. Maybe that was a normal seizure. Some things are explainable, but so many are not. How did the attic door lock us in? How on earth were the voices of people we knew being heard in the house, calling to us? I wrote this while exhausted from work, so forgive the writing etiquette. Just wanted to share this story on here as I've shared with many others before. Okay. All right. Well, that's going to wrap us up for our nightly dose of some good old possession stories, so thank you for joining us. And a huge thank you, as always, to our paid supporters of the show, Modelo Time, Cleet Meat, Claytor Lord of Soup, Curtis and Lara, Mothman, Devin, Lara, Conklin Family, and Lou. The constant support really helps us out. And if you want to be among these great people, the link is down below. You can add, is it three is our lowest? It's three, five, ten. Three, five, eight, and ten. Yeah. You can help donate three, five, eight, or ten dollars to the show, and we'll call your name out on every episode. And you get to help us travel around and upgrade our equipment and all that fun stuff. And as we chase now a thousand subscribers, we're always looking for a place to go after the Clown Motel. So let us know where you want us to trek out, and we can make it happen. We should get close to Skinwalker Ranch. That'd be neat. That'd be neat. Yeah. So we can't actually go, though. It's like, we're yeah. camping next to Skinwalker. I'll have to, like, message whatever his name is. The billionaire bought it on Twitter or whatever. He'll respond. Post Malone. Hey, bitch. Let us on the property. All right. Anyways, if you're watching us on YouTube, please like, share, and subscribe as it really helps us get us out there. And as always, thank you for entering the abyss. Until next time.